Okay, so uh, most of the previous presenters showed the results from uh, single view instruments and here I'm going to show you a couple of uh, examples from uh, multi-angle remote sensing and use this as a framework to touch upon some of the issues, challenges that we still have uh, in the remote sensing of clouds and uh, aerosol and surface uh, properties. So specifically I will use uh, examples from the multi-angle imaging spectral radiometer or MISER instrument. And this instrument is on the Terra satellite. Um, the unique feature of the instrument is that in addition to the downward looking nadir view, it has uh, eight uh, additional oblique uh, view angles. The um, uh, satellite moves uh, from north to south and uh, so in addition to the nadir view, you have a forward looking 70 degree view 60 degrees, 46 and 26 degrees, and you have the, the same uh, angles uh, looking backwards. And um, so this instrument um, uh, has uh, uh, four bands, four spectral bands, so very few spectral bands, basically the RGB uh, visible bands and the near infrared uh, band. So it's, it's spectrally, uh, it's not, not a very uh, a good instrument, but it makes up for this uh, shortcoming by looking at uh, clouds and uh, aerosols and surface scenes from different uh, view angles. The resolution is around 300 meters, so it's, it's uh, a medium resolution instrument like MODIS. So how does the MISER uh, imaging work? So you have a scene, let's focus on a cloud, you have the sun, and then as the uh, sun hit, uh, radiation hits the cloud, uh, the cloud or any other scene uh, reflects radiation in, in uh, all different directions. And as the MISER instrument comes along, it basically samples this uh, angular reflected radiation at these nine specific angles. Um, a traditional instrument usually gives you the nadir view or the near nadir view. And we have these nine angles, nine images uh, collected in seven minutes. The time difference between the cameras is, is not linear, so sometimes it's a half a <coughs> minute, sometimes it's a minute or a little more. So the, the strength uh, of, the, of the instrument and the data or the information content comes from how the uh, radiance, the brightness varies with angle. So let's just uh, look at a couple of examples. You get these uh, little animations from uh, the night cameras. So this is a scene, uh, this is uh, Florida, in Cuba and you have a couple of clouds and as you move through <coughs> the nine cameras uh, you see a couple of things. First you see that uh, clouds move and you also see that uh, for instance the surface uh, reflectance especially with the ocean changes with view angle. The same happens for clouds but it's in, in this image it, it's uh, not shown very well. Another example is uh, thunderheads from Hurricane Carlotta and this little animation just shows you how different the world looks from nine different angles. So these are uh, thunder clouds and this is the forward looking uh, 70 degree view and uh, here you basically see the, the shadowed side of the clouds and as you move through the nine cameras you see the top and then from the uh, backward looking direction you see the, uh, the sunlit side of the clouds. So it gives you an appreciation of how three-dimensional uh, the world is and, and the clouds are. So the, one of the main uh, products of MISER is simply cloud top height. And it's, uh, it's a simple property, but it's important. And uh, as uh, John showed yesterday and uh, others uh, at Hartwick today, uh, we still have some problems with, with the cloud top height retrievals with the traditional techniques. So MISER uses this very simple stereo technique, which is basically what your eye does as you uh, perceive depth. You look at the thing from two different perspectives. Um, so if you have a cloud, oops, uh, and you look at this cloud from uh, this camera, uh, on the surface, it will, its image will be projected right here. If you look at it from a different angle, uh, the position of the cloud within the image uh, will shift. And this uh, measurement, this distance is called the disparity or parallax, uh, astronomers call it the parallax. And from this parallax, 
with a very simple uh, geometry, if you know the angles, you can calculate the platelet height. And the advantage of MISER is that it's a, it's a geometric technique, so it doesn't need any ancillary information from uh, numerical value prediction models, temperature profiles, or, uh, or uh, humidity profiles. And also, the technique is not sensitive to radiometric calibration, so if you have a long data set, uh, your radiometers uh, might drift. Uh, other people have talked about how much effort goes into intercalibrating instruments. With MISER, uh, <clears throat> we're not sensitive to this, so in a, in a climate data uh, sense, uh, it, ha it has advantages. Now, the problem is, is uh, that um, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, wind during the, uh, between the images, so the, the cloud uh, moves with the uh, uh, well, with a cloud motion wind. So if you look at two different images and then measure the, the distance between the location of the cloud, in the meantime, uh, the cloud uh, also might move. So you have a problem where you have two unknowns, the wind speed and the cloud to height in one uh, measurement. So the obvious solution is to use uh, a third image and then you have two disparity measurements uh, and two unknowns, so you can pull out both the wind and the height simultaneously. And that's another advantage of uh, this kind of technique, it's because in traditionally, traditional cloud motion winds, you do these two steps separately. So first you calculate the, high, uh, the cloud motion, and then you use a completely different step uh, to calculate the height. And the height is important for cloud motion winds because that's basically the biggest uncertainty uh, in, in the or the, the biggest problem affecting the use of uh, cloud motion winds in <coughs> weather prediction, the geostationary satellites can measure wind fairly accurately in most uh, occasions, but if you put the wind in the wrong height, then you basically, <coughs> actually, you can uh, negatively affect the, the forecast. And uh, with MISER, you get it in a single step. Uh, now, the wind is also important uh, simply if you want to create high-resolution cloud to pipe maps, because if you, if you just use two cameras, two near the cameras, where the wind effect is, is smaller, uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you don't account for uh, the shift in the, due to the cloud motion wind, then uh, you, a meters per second wind will bias your heights, uh, depending on the wind speed, either positively or negatively, uh, by 100 meters. Yeah? Uh, yeah, well, the, the MISER, uh, the Terra satellite has a height of 700 kilometers. So that's why you have the, this, the, the angles uh, are important. Uh, the geostation satellites are 36,000 kilometers away. So you have a very, basically these, these vectors are almost parallel. So you don't have uh, the, the cloud motion effect with the with geo. Uh, and you use a, a WGS 84 geoid. So you have a reference surface that your images yeah. are projected to. Yeah, it's a reference geoid that uh, uh, people use. Oops, wrong direction. Okay, so what you do uh, is just an example um, how a wind retrieval works. You take the forward looking D camera. This is a scene of 70 kilometers. We calculate one horizontal wind uh, vector for a 70 kilometer region. And then you take uh, the 46 degree camera view and then the nadir. And uh, there are some differences between the images. So you can see this is a little blurrier and you see the sides. And what you do is you use some pattern recognition software <coughs> to try to identify the same cloud in these different images. And from the locations, you pull out, in this case, a cloud to height, three and a half kilometers, and the wind speed is 70, 17 meters per second. And the motivation as I said, is, is twofold. One, I mentioned that the traditional uh, cloud uh, height retrievals uh, <coughs> can have big errors. The other one is that uh, if you look at the, the satellite uh, winds that are used in the ECMWF model, uh, this might be updated, but it shows the, uh, the basic point I want to make. Uh, these circles show you the, the geostation satellites, so Meteosat and uh, GOES. And, um, in the, in the poles, or at the poles, you also can use a uh, MODIS instrument, which is also on Terra, uh, a polar orbiting uh, uh, satellite. You can also use, uh, in the polar regions, some MODIS imagery where the tracks overlap. 
and you apply the same idea as for the geo, that you uh, animate these images and try to look at the motion of the clouds. But here the time difference is, is uh, something like nine, 90 minutes between images, as opposed to let's say five or 15 minutes here. But uh, basically the, the geo satellites go up to a latitude of 60 degrees and then it's too oblique view, you can't see anything. And then uh, the MODIS also ends uh, somewhere around, I don't know, uh, 65 or 70 degrees because the, the orbits don't overlap anymore. So you have basically uh, between the, these two uh, instruments, you have a, a data gap area where you don't get uh, satellite winds. And the uh, high latitudes, uh, uh, people are pretty desperate uh, to, to get winds uh, in any way you can. So here is just an example uh, for a miser uh, particular orbit. Um, one thing I want to mention is that it's a very narrow swath instrument. So it's only 360 kilometers wide. And um, this is a, a cyclone, exotropical cyclone. And you get these wind vectors every 70 kilometers. And the associated height in the same, uh, same step. So what goes uh, uh, forward uh, next is, is uh, the, the wind retrieval is just an internal step uh, to get the much higher resolution cloud top heights, which you calculate at a one kilometer resolution. And what you do is that you assume that the wind is more or less constant over a 70 kilometer region. And then you can use just two cameras, near native cameras, to calculate the, the height uh, at a much higher resolution using this uh, 70 kilometer wind as a correction. So this is the end product. Uh, it's a Hurricane Juliet, and you get uh, uh, the stereo heights at one kilometer resolution. And you can see if things go from whatever zero to maybe, maybe 16 uh, kilometers. Now you can do the same, uh, play the same game, not just for clouds, but for anything that uh, uh, shows up in your images. So here's an example uh, for a, a forest fire in California. The left image is from MODIS, uh, and the right image is the Miser Cloud Top Heights. <clears throat> they are both on the uh, same satellite, Terra. And with, with traditional instruments, the pulling out the height might be fairly difficult, especially for thin, uh, thin aerosol layers where you have contribution from the surface, for instance. Um, with Miser, you get this, uh, this nice uh, height map. Uh, you know, it goes up to maybe four kilometers. And why it's important is because uh, dispersion models uh, really need this so-called so injection height to model how uh, forest fires or uh, uh, anything else, uh, pollution uh, basically spreads. And the combination of these two um, just shows the, the strength of the spectral method and the strength of the angular method. So MODIS has uh, thermal bands. It has 36 bands, not just four like Miser. So these red dots, if you can see them, you can see through the smoke with these spectral channels, and you can pinpoint the location of the fire. Uh, with MISER, if you use it in Synergy, then you can uh, also get the, the height, which is an important parameter, as I mentioned, uh, for dispersion modeling. This is a, just another example for this uh, uh, volcanic, uh, Icelandic volcano. It's impossible to pronounce its name. Um, so it, here is this plume, and then the MISER heights uh, basically show that uh, it went up to maybe six kilometers. And there was a bunch of uh, in-situ and LIDAR measurements. And it turns out MISER was among the best or uh, better uh, instruments, actually probably the best, uh, in terms of the, the height retrieval of, of, uh, of this, this plume. And for this plume, it wasn't that uh, crucial because uh, it was fairly accessible. But you have uh, uh, pretty isolated volcanoes uh, where, where uh, injection height uh, is not readily available from uh, in-situ measurements. So MISER has a data set, actually a dedicated project to, to pull out uh, um, uh, volcanic height, uh, height fields. So here I just demonstrate why the stereotechnic or where the stereotechnic might work uh, better than traditional instruments. <coughs> um, it's basically uh, a set, uh, stratocumulus field in the South Atlantic. And the left image uh, is at the Miser overpass time at 10.30. And this is the aqua uh, overpass time uh, four hours later. And the, these are meteor set images. And uh, unfortunately, we're not in aqua. So we can't use the, 
the LiDAR Calypso to validate the Meiser height, but in this case, we sort of did implicit validation because the field doesn't move, uh, doesn't change much. It's a fairly stable field, and these clouds are at a one and a half, two kilometer height. So in the left, I show the, the Meiser uh, overpass where it samples this cloud, and then four hours later, the Calypso LiDAR comes along and it samples uh, uh, the cloud on, on the west side. So the left panel shows uh, measurements from the MISO overpass time. The, the gray area is where the ECMWF model uh, diagnosed cloud. The black line is the uh, diagnosed boundary layer height. And you see that the cloud is around cloud to pi, it's two kilometers. Now the MISO heights are here at the top, uh, these, these circles, and they in fairly good agreement with, the, with what the model said. The meteor set uh, cloud heights are way uh, biased negative, so sometimes below uh, 500 meters. And the reason is because you have these uh, um, open cells and uh, thin clouds, and you have a big uh, pixel size, six kilometer versus miles of 300 meters, and you can have contribution from the surface. So if you use the temperature, cloud to temperature to pull out the height, uh, in this case, you can bias the height low. Um, now the right panel is the uh, Calypso overpass time, so we only have Calypso measurements here, no MISO. And it's the same deal. Uh, this is the cloud, the, the gray area. Now the Calypso cloud top heights red and the cloud bottom heights green. They agree fairly well actually with the model, so these kind of people are fairly happy. And the, the meteors at height, it just shows the same uh, message as the same, same problem that you have again, uh, fairly low uh, cloud height. So, uh, and that, that's important when you try to digest these winds at the right height into the weather prediction model. Another issue that was mentioned yesterday uh, by John um, in relation to the overshooting tops. So uh, one of the techniques that's used to retrieve cloud top heights is that you just measure the 10.8 micron brightness temperature of a cloud. And then you use uh, an NWP temperature profile and then you basically fix the height where you have the, uh, the temperature, uh, the, your measured temperature. So there are two problems with that. One is that um, if you have an inversion, and that was also John's point, if you have an inversion, uh, you might have two solutions. So uh, same temperature corresponds to two different heights. And depending on how democratic you are, whether you have a bottom-up or a top-down approach, MODIS uses a top-down approach. It goes from the top of the temperature curve, and then it basically finds the, uh, this temperature. So it can bias the heights really high. The other problem is that very often you, your temperature profile, NWP profile, doesn't even pick up the, the inversion. So here is an example on the right side. Uh, it's, it's a cross-section of the South Atlantic. Uh, going from the cetacule region to, uh, towards the equator. And this is a so-called stratocumulus to cumulus transition area where your uh, stratocule, as you move north close to the equator, breaks up, and then the cloud top heights increase. So the, and that's an important area that, for instance, the climate models want to understand how this transition uh, occurs because it affects albedo and so forth. So you have the Calypso data, uh, the black one, and it shows this... Uh, 500 meter uh, increase as you move to the uh, cumulus region. And the, the other curve is the ver collection five modis. So it's the old modis. Uh, and you see it where you have the static region and you have the inversion. You can have pretty high one, two kilometer uh, overestimations. Now modis knows this, so it's, it's, it's nothing new. Um, so what they're going to do in collection six is that uh, instead of using this uh, flat top temperature or, or numerical weather prediction temperature profile, they basically use the difference, the temperature difference between the sea surface and uh, the measured cloud top height, and then just fix uh, a temperature lapse rate within this region, and then you can calculate uh, the, the cloud top height and uh, try to minimize this, this issue. Now, the next example should show the corresponding miser measurements. So here again, the black curve is Calypso, and one point here, you can see that it's pretty, uh, it's pretty jumpy because Calypso is a point measurement and you have very narrow swath width. So uh, it just shows that uh, 
Um, this is a very small footprint measurement, so very good for profiling, but for calculating, uh, um, and this is four years of data, so calculating uh, <coughs> averages, you still have a lot of sampling issues. It's just uh, very, you're lucky if you hit a cloud or uh, you miss a cloud. So now, again, the black curve is sort of our reference, the, the Calypso LiDAR measurements, very accurate. So the, this dotted line shows what MISER gives you if you don't include uh, the wind correction. So you just use two neonated cameras, and it, it basically just a flat curve. So it, it emphasizes, again, that without wind correction, uh, it, it's crucial. Wind correction is crucial for the stereo retrievals. And the red and the blue curves are just different steps in the processing, uh, focused just on the, on the blue one. That's the final uh, miser height with the everything, including uh, wind as well. And it, it fits very well, fairly well uh, the, the LiDAR measurements, uh, as opposed to uh, the traditional brightness temperature based method. Okay, uh, so originally we had um, the miser retrievals done at 70 kilometers, and with a very narrow swath width, you only get six or seven uh, winds across the swath. And uh, just a couple of months ago, we introduced a new uh, product uh, where we increased the resolution uh, fourfold. Um, so here is the, the difference what you get in, in detail now with the new uh, 17 kilometer uh, miser winds. And um, in this new product, uh, we also have uh, now uh, a new wind field that we calculate. I didn't mention, but uh, uh, in the first slide where I showed that uh, cloud, cloud motion, wind, and height uh, are mixed together in these measurements, it only occurs in the along track direction because the cameras are uh, aligned or distributed in that direction. For the cross track winds, which is mostly east west for this kind of orbit, we can do, uh, we, we don't have this, this alias in between height and wind. Parallaxes, so you can do measurements at much even higher resolution and more accurately. So we introduced a new product where we calculate just the cross track, so east-west wind component uh, at one kilometer resolution. And here I show you an example, uh, which I think, or we think it's an overshooting top, uh, it's Hurricane Ida. So uh, we go through the nine miser images, uh, and then you see this top uh, growing within seven minutes. And some, some of the, sometimes the time difference is maybe 50 seconds between these uh, cameras. So you have these nine uh, measurements. And then uh, the, the overshooting top here was uh, 40 kilometer in diameter. And on the right, I show you the new product, the east-west cross-track winds at one kilometer resolution. And what you see is where you have this overshooting top. On one side, you have uh, Westerly winds, on the other side, you have easterly winds. So as this plume goes up, it pushes the air out. So we think that that's, that might be one uh, uh, idea to, to look at, uh, to look for overshooting tops where you see this pattern in the cross track wind where uh, things basically diverge uh, the, the wind field. You also see the heights. So you have this, uh, this area of the cloud is maybe 12 kilometers, and then uh, this guy goes to maybe 15. So this is one area that we we think we might want to experiment with uh, if we can uh, connect it with, with uh, meteor set or we should think of uh, top detection and height retrievals. One final example for the winds, uh, we can even do uh, full uh, wind vectors at uh, four kilometer resolution. And here I just uh, exemplify this with, uh, with uh, a Karman vortex street around Jan Mayan Island. It's an uh, island in the North Atlantic, so you don't even see it with, with meteor set. And this is the island, and it has a volcano. In this image, you can actually see the, uh, the, uh, the side of the volcano, which is not covered by snow. And um, you see this nice uh, vortex street. Uh, the length is some, something like 350 kilometers, and it's 17, 70 kilometers across. And as I go through the nine uh, images, you see again a couple of things. First, you see that the, uh, the volcano just moves as you change your perspective, and now you see the, uh, the snow-covered part of the, oops, uh, the volcano. The other thing you see, if you have good eyes, that these uh, things rotate, and uh, the top line rotates uh, clockwise, the, this line rotates counterclockwise. So now, uh, that's what I show here. And um, 
The bottom image shows this uh, experimental product where we do 4.4 kilometer resolution wind retrievals, and that's, that's pretty, I think it's pretty high uh, for a satellite. And uh, if you remove the uh, upstream wind, so you sort of move with the, with the wind field, then uh, in some, you can very nicely pick out uh, these counter-rotating vortices. And from the wind field, you can calculate the, the vorticity I show here. So the bottom line is uh, counterclockwise rotating, so uh, positive vorticity and the negative vorticity. And um, so if you plot the vorticity as a function, this is vorticity, as a function of uh, distance from the, uh, from the island, uh, you see this nice decrease in the, in the vorticity. Um, from 10 to 5, so it, it halves uh, uh, as, you, as you move down, uh, downstream. And uh, we were happy that we found uh, some recent uh, LES modeling from uh, uh, a group from Hanover, uh, where they did uh, LES modeling of, of this vortex, similar vortex streets. And uh, uh, not knowing us, they also were struggling with fixing their, their vorticity. <coughs> so they just put something out of, I'm not saying thin air, but uh, it was a good guess. And, uh, so they have more uh, cases and uh, more runs, but basically you see the, see the, the same uh, kind of the magnitude uh, and, and decrease in the magnitude with, with distance. So uh, these high resolution winds can be used uh, to validate LES models and inform uh, simulations of, of this, this uh, uh, atmospheric vorticity phenomena. Okay, so that was uh, winds and heights. So now something completely different. Um, now, just uh, uh, examples of where MISER can help uh, the retrieval of uh, cloud microphysical properties. Uh, so I don't know if uh, I wasn't here earlier, but probably you know about this Nak Nakajima King bispectral technique to pull out uh, optical thickness and effective radius of clouds. So you take a visible and a water absorbing measurement and you model uh, how these radiances uh, change with optical thickness and effective radius. So you, you have this lookup table from 1D uh, modeling, and then you fix, if you have a me two bispectral measurements, then you can basically pull out the effective radius and optical thickness of the clouds. Now, the problem is here that um, <coughs> these lookup tables are derived assuming plane parallel homogeneous clouds. So you have uh, a horizontal infinite cloud, uh, no variation in the extinction and the flat top. Uh, in reality, you have, of course, uh, cloud top heterogeneity, where you have effects such as side illumination, uh, where you have a, a cloud side and it, it's extra illuminated by, by the sun, which is not modeled here because it's a flat top. And you also have the, uh, the opposite, the, the shadowing effects. And it, it can bias your results if you try to interpret uh, the signal coming from real cloud with an assumed flat screen parallel cloud. Another type of heterogeneity is just horizontally, even if you have a flat top, things can vary uh, the extinction. And uh, if you look at uh, a real scene, this is a miser scene, deep south uh, in the ocean and very uh, high solos in thing, very, low, very high solos in thing, it's a very low sun, where these effects are very much uh, uh, accentuated. So you see shadows and uh, uh, bright sides again, the shadows of the clouds. So the world is fairly uh, non-plane parallel. So what you can do when you have uh, <coughs> multi-angle measurements is that uh, you can test whether your model uh, is actually a good one to retrieve your cloud properties. So the left image, uh, it shows radiance, so brightness basically, and uh, it's just uh, views in the angles, so you have nine measurements at the nine different uh, angles. The blue one is the miser measurement for a particular cloud. Uh, and it varies like this. So decreases, in this case, the brightness with angle. And the dashed lines are just plus or minus 5% around that miser measurement. And now this cloud was fairly plain parallel because if uh, you, we could fit uh, the, with the dice or plain parallel model, uh, the measured radiance is fairly well if you assume an optical thickness of 37 and uh, whatever effective radius it was. So in this case, uh, things are good. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have some uh, uh, trust in the retrievals. Now the left, the right side is a case when it doesn't work. So the, again, the blue is uh, the miser measurements. And then these two curves are 
plane parallel models fitting the lowest and the highest measurement, miser measurements. Uh, and and uh, basically, you can see that the, the shape of the plane parallel curve is, is completely different. So you can't fix the model, fit the model at all angles. And you can have, depending on which angle you want to use to retrieve your uh, effective uh, optical thickness, you have a huge range of uh, optical thicknesses. Uh, and and it's, uh, clearly, it's another three, it's another plane parallel cloud. So what you can do is now we test uh, what percentage of the time you actually have a plane parallel cloud. So here I show the, uh, the percentage of clouds that fit the model versus the number of cameras we use. So if you have, if you're a MODIS or traditional instrument and you have one measurement, you just have to assume that it works. So you, you do it all the time. Now if you throw in two more cameras, uh, then basically it throws out uh, almost 50% of the cloud. So you, you, you can't even fit three measurements now within 5% uh, uh, radiance. And as you go down to all the nine cameras, you reach something like uh, maybe 20% of the clouds uh, are plane parallel within 5%. Uh, it depends on resolution too, but uh, it's just a minor point. So now this was, this was done uh, early on with 100 orbits. And then um, Larry de Jerome, a colleague in UIUC, uh, repeated it for several years. And then just constantly in the top panel, it basically shows the same percentage. What percentage of the clouds are playing parallel or can be retrieved with the plane parallel model? And January and July, and what you see is uh, the red is where it works. That for the uh, StatoQ regions and uh, the summer hemisphere, uh, clouds, it works fairly well, but uh, for the winter hemisphere, uh, you have fairly low passing rates. And uh, now it's the summer, the northern hemisphere summer, and southern hemisphere winter. So again, it's it's uh, it shifts depending on the on the season. And the reason is because of the solar zenith angle. So when you have in in the uh, winter season, you have very low suns uh, sun angles. Uh, when you use polar orbiter uh, imagery. Uh, <clears throat> and um, the bottom figure is a similar uh, uh, figure, and it just shows the correlation with this passing rate, so how plane parallel the clouds are with a measure of, of heterogeneity. Uh, this is a heterogeneity of the radiation. So you, you take the standard deviation of your field, a couple of kilometer field, and just see how smooth uh, the brightness is. Uh, and the more variation you have, the more heterogeneous your clouds are, probably more uh, cloud to variation and so on. And these are very well correlated. So the hope is that if you can measure some sort of heterogeneity uh, index from space, uh, then uh, you can uh, flag your retrievals based on it, uh, whether you can trust your, your retrievals. And I think that's, that's, uh, that should be something that should be added to these uh, uh, traditional optical thickness retrieval models now a measure of heterogeneity as a quality index. And where it connects with, uh, with my other work is uh, on, on liquid water path retrievals is here I show a similar map, um, the difference between microwave and uh, MODIS optical visible near infrared measurements of liquid water path. And liquid water path is basically just the product of optical thickness and effective radius. And here is the, the bias between the two. It's on the same satellite, uh, these two instruments. And the microwave is much less sensitive to these uh, heterogeneity effects and cloud of variations. So what you see is that uh, the difference is small, uh, relatively small in these uh, static regions where we just, these are the most plain per clouds probably you can get. But at high latitudes, this is the annual mean, at high latitudes you have pretty large differences. Uh, the optical measurements overestimate very strongly the liquid water path, in my opinion. So if you plot it, uh, uh, just concentrate on this left figure, it's the zonal mean. And the black curve is the microwave liquid water path measurement. Uh, and the red one, just look at just the red one, is the MODIS. And what you see is uh, lower latitudes, they sort of agree. Uh, you have this peak around the ITCZ. But at high latitudes, you don't see much of an increase in the microwave measurements of cloud water, while the red curve just uh, basically uh, goes up. So there's a factor of two, can be a factor of two difference in, in uh, liquid water path estimates uh, 
uh, depending on which satellite you use, and uh, that's an issue that has to be resolved because you have to decide your, which, which curve you're going to fit your uh, GCM to. And the reason is, I also showed you here in the dotted line, is, is the solar zenith angle effect. Uh, these modest retrievals are very sensitive to uh, solar zenith angle effects. Um, and uh, here I show a modis path. So my time is up, but I think I studied 10 minutes later, so shall I stop or? Anyway, I finish this one and then uh, I'll stop. So uh, <clears throat> with modis, um, uh, here I show you the, uh, the, how the view zenith angle ma uh, varies with modis. So I said that modis is an nadir instrument, but it actually scans across the swath. So you actually can get uh, uh, view angles up to 60 degrees at the edge of the swath. Uh, but you only take one measurement of a cloud at a time. So you can fake uh, sort of a, a fake uh, statistically, a statistical analysis of, of uh, statistical matching analysis where you collect enough data, uh, not from the same cloud, but similar kind of clouds, then you can build up also a statistical dependence uh, of, of these modus measurements as a function of uh, view angle and, and sun angle. And uh, okay, so let's just go to the uh, summary slide where on the right I show you um, how the microwave measurements vary. The x-axis is across the swath and the y-axis is, is uh, solar zenith angle latitude basically. And you see it's fairly flat so it, it doesn't show much variation with uh, view angle or solar zenith angle and that's what you should get. If you have a good model it should work under all sun view geometries. Uh, in contrast the modis measurements First of all, it shows a huge increase with solos in this angle. So high sun, you really get very high uh, measurements and I think biased high. And also the shape across the swath uh, at high solos in the angles uh, shows this U shape. So you basically retrieve clouds that are, uh, look like this. So the edges, they are much thicker and obviously it's, it's, it's an artifact. All right, so uh, for the, in the interest of time, I, I'll, I'll finish. Uh, early, so I'm not going to go through other examples. Uh, but so just uh, this is one last example for aerosols. So uh, if you go through these images, uh, as you increase your views in the angle, uh, you can pick out uh, these very thin aerosol layers fairly nicely, uh, which you don't see in the major image. So uh, the, the, the oblique view has uh, uh, advantages in terms of uh, sensitivity to, to thin stuff. So let me finish with this, a uh, little promo. So Miser has this game, uh, uh, I used to have it, where you go to the Miser website and they show you an image with a couple of clues it's, uh, and then you have to send in your answer what the image is, uh, which area, and then they give you this nice uh, professionally produced uh, 3D anaglyph with the uh, red and blue glasses where you can see the, the 3D structure of, of things. So this is one of the examples. Uh, and uh, I can't participate because I'm part of the team, but uh, if you're interested, you can get some nice posters uh, from the website. By the way, does anyone recognize what this, this is? If I say Darwin, Charles Darwin. Galapagos. Yeah, it's a Galapagos Island. Usually they rotate the image, so they try to screw your mind, screw with you. Anyway, uh, so that's, that's what I have.